Yes, you're tuned into the Combat Jack Show, CombatJackShow.com. King, do we even fucking have a website up right now? Does it even make fucking sense yes, we do to have promote it. the fucking website? I haven't been on a website. Internets. Internets, well, full disclosure. <laughs> I have not been on my own website in like eight fucking months. <laughs> Does well, it even fucking make sense to, mem- to promote the website? The website is live. See, what happened was... What had happened was? I don't know. Squarespace. I don't know. What's up, Square, Squarespace? We ain't, we ain't cool no more? Wait, do we need to sue them? I mean, it's, it's it's a dub. It's a dub for that. So we don't have a website. So we, we transitioned to some, some another hosting. Okay. So I don't give. A, you know what? At the end of the day, man, like it's twenty. Internet. We need. We, it's no, no. Listen, listen, listen. What's up? At twenty seventeen, man, everything is counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. Everybody has websites, right? Everybody's yeah. shooting video, right? Everybody's grabbing all this content. But do we have to do that? Do we have to do? No, that? but we just, we should we should have a destination for people to go to. Um, it but isn't to... our YouTube page popping right now? No. It, no, what's it's all right. No. It's not. It's, it, it, it could be much better. We fucking up in the nah, game. Nah, we not fucking. We need more hands, man. We always need like like we haven't had a photographer, or videographer in a while. Well, who's who's, and then who's Dove, fly like who? at fly, fly like Dove? Yes. You know she 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 she's here. She's down Shout with. The, she's fly, on fly. the team. Yeah, she's she's in the building. So that's one cog. <laughs> yes. In the big wheel. You know what I mean. Yes. And uh. We just need more hands, man. Some trustworthy hands. Why, why we? Why don't? Why don't we have them? Whose fault is that? That's what I want to know. Let's not because you're you're the, not, you're no, the general no, manager nah, of this go. operation. Here we right go. Now. Now I'm, the I'm just manager. fucking talent. That's new. So I need to know <laughs> who's who needs to get fired so nah, we can get more hands. We don't have, on the call by junk show. We don't have enough hands to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> listen, let's let's get this. Sh- come on, man. Come on. Nah, listen, listen. Internet. We've been doing this shit the longest right now. It's seven years. Listen, internet. Yes. Who's been holding y'all down for the past six summers? And we're about to go into our seventh summer. It's That's a combat a fact. jack show. I'm not popping my collar. It's just I'm committed to the fucking shit that we do for mm. the culture. Come on, King. Come on, King. Come on, King. Come on, King. Come on. I'm not. I'm not saying you. I'm not. Internet, I'm not saying King, but I'm saying, come on, King. Um, <laughs> Internet, you know, do we have any announcements, man? Shout out to Road Mike. Can we, can, well, the last episode, well, the Rock Marciano episode, Yeah. Um, we kind of alluded that we were going to be on the road soon. Okay. We're about so, to be on the road, Internet, yeah. and, and I still don't want to, until these shows fully develop, because right. things change. But it's more closer We're about than to not. do some live shows in New York City. Yes. We have a we have a show coming up soon with, well, <clears throat> with Mark, Rock Marciano. Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, some other shows coming up. We're about to go on the road. What's, what's the first state we're going to, man? City. Atlanta. Atlanta, ATL. M- May, May 19th. Oh, my God. Lit. A- a- ATL, ATL, ATL. Um, you know, Internet, I've been holding this back for a while, but this is a project that I've been working on for the past year. If you can imagine somebody working on a podcast for the past year, but this April, um, I'm proud to announce... Um, that I've entered to a partnership with uh, Spotify and Gimlet Media and Loudspeakers uh, Network. And it's a, it's a six-episodic series called Mogul, The Life, Life and Death of Chris Lighty. It's coming out very soon. We put our heart and soul into it. We're about to change the fucking game um, to, the, to the podcast community that's been the community. Um, you know that we continue to raise the bar. You know that we continue to re- you know represent you guys until you guys have jumped into this podcast came thinking that y'all had it niggas fall back popping the collar mm. she's about to change um is that it do we have anything else to announce before we jump into uh, a very special yeah that's, i think that's about it for now Thank internets you. um i've been following this man i just realized today that i've been following this man for a full 10 years mm-hmm. um i came in contact with his work and his art and his craft 10 years ago um he had an album called undisputed truth truth and I was so amazed that, you know, I was still kind of unplugging myself from the shit that I had become accustomed to while, when I was in the um, quote unquote industry proper. And I was like really searching for like a new meaning of life, a new meaning of purpose um, in terms of my space in this space um, and really feeding and getting a lot of life off of artists that might not, might, might, might not have been recognized by the industry proper. Um, I always credit, like, back in 2004 when I left the industry, 
I always credit um, Little Brother and Doom as the two artists that really made me realize that there's still hope in this game. And they gave me such, they re, reignited the fire in my belly in terms of how much I love this culture. Ten years ago, I came across Brother Ali's album, Undisputed Truth, and I was like, yo, this brother's dope. I had never heard of this dude before. I never knew that cats were spitting so hard from Minnesota. And since then, I followed this career, his career. I've been very fortunate enough to have had personal encounters with Brother Ali, um, where not only did we speak as peers, but I spoke as a fan. I think he spoke as somebody who supported our movement for the past few years. And then um, two years ago, I was down in um, Minnesota, um, Giant Steps, and I had a great opportunity to meet him. And he was so hospitable and he welcomed me to the city. And it was it's just one of those, you know, when you meet somebody and you know, like, yo, I don't care if I met him for five minutes. I don't care if I met him for five hours. I don't care if I've been rocking with this dude for 10 years. I fucks with this dude. I got this dude's back. So without further ado, let's welcome to the Combat Jack Show, Mr. Brother Ali. Mm, mm, mm. What's up, Mr. <laughs> Ali? How I'm, are you, sir? I'm, I'm really happy to be here with Yo, you. Yo, I'm so disappointed in myself right now because I had a few drinky drinks before <laughs> no, this episode, man. so I'm a little slurry no, right be now. Comfortable. Be comfortable, man. No, I'm so comfortable, but I'm just saying because I have because I hold you in such high regard. Well, that, that that's why you can be comfortable. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you have a new album yeah. coming out. On First, is, let me say I love this show a lot, and it's interesting that you say. The, the spot that you were in you when you found my music, because I was in a similar place when I found your podcast. I, I knew about it, you know, but when I first heard about it, it was, you know, Dallas was here and, you Premium, know, Just, and, Just was here Just and, and Gene Gray would come through a yes. lot. And it was funny. It was like a, you know what I'm saying? Like it was a very like high energy, funny joint. And that's, that's, that's cool. But what spoke to me is like slowly, like some of those people kind of like, you know, moved on to other things. And then it was just you in a room with a mic and and uh pete from time to time and um you have this really magical way of getting people to open up and be themselves and be vulnerable uh because they know that they're safe with you and they know that they're at home with you and i think there's something also like you know we were talking a little bit off air but there's there's something about the way that men talk to you you know what i'm saying because you know we look at you as a big brother and so we're confiding in you you know, to a degree. And, um, you know, one of the first ones that I heard when I realized the new format was D nice, Mm. you know, which is still undisputedly. I think it's your, I think it's your great. It's my favorite episode. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's probably, it's, it might be the, the most important interview in hip hop, you know? And I say that as like somebody that's like, really, I I love, you know, the stories of this culture and all of that. <clears throat> but I mean, the fact that that's one of the most important, if you really just think about all of the different elements of that story, you know, the fact that with with, with Chris, you're dealing with KRS, the teacher, you're dealing with, you know, homeless youth and Scott LaRock as a social worker. Yes, you know what I mean? The, the the cultural and like generational element of, of the way that this thing really happens, you know, and then, um, you know, the, the interpersonal relationships between D-Nice and KRS with KRS being this like really daunting, like alpha male kind of figure, um, you know, but and, still, but still completely respectful to the culture and respectful to the person that allowed him to be who he was, which was Scott LaRock. Right. But, but, but D nice had a strained relationship with him for years. Cause he felt like this yes. was a big brother that, that, that kind of was, was, he felt like he had a grudge against him. And so when he when he starts telling the story, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody that hasn't heard it yet, but when he starts telling the story, I've never heard the details of that story told like that. No one's I don't ever think heard the that. world ever heard right. that before. Because KRS obviously has trauma around it. And um, you know, so seeing D Nice be able to talk through that, he wouldn't have done that with anybody. And I love Angie and there's a lot of people that are, you know, really great and do this very, very well. But I don't think he could have had that conversation with anybody but you. And then but that was our era. That was my era. Yeah, me too. I mean, when I was thirteen, KRS brought me on stage. And what? He was, yeah. You 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 got to talk about that, man. Yeah. So he was doing a lecture tour for Edutainment, and the uh, you know that if you listen to the the little clips on Edutainment, he's talking. You know what I'm saying? Rap music. What is it? Rap music is when you have American Music Awards, you have what is called theft. You know what I'm saying? I was at one of those lectures. And uh, I was 13 years old and I had the Stop the Violence book 
And he brought me on stage. I have a picture of it on my phone I can show you when we get there. You were 13. 13 years old. That's crazy, man. Yeah, he brought me on stage and he told me to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And that's what led to me becoming Muslim when I was 15. Wow. Yeah. So, So the fact that they told that story and then, and I've, and then all of my heroes have embraced me. Uh, not just in rap. So, you know, the first people to take me on tour were Atmosphere, which are my big brothers and label mates. But then Brand Nubian took me on tour. Uh, Rakim took me on tour twice. Ghostface took me on tour. Like all of the people that I look up to the most. I'm on uh, Chuck D's records and he's on mine. He's a big brother to, and a mentor to me. Um, you know, Cornell West is a friend and a mentor and, you know, Minister Farrakhan. And like all of these people that I look up to, I've, I've, come, in, I've, I've come together with all of them. KRS was actually kind of rough with me. Really? The, what do you do, man? Because KRS is... He was just, I, you know... He I, can be a little... Uh, as, as Uncle KRS, he yeah. can be Uncle KRS. Yeah, right but, but the thing is that there's certain people that, like, when, you, when, when you're raised in culture and you know that, like, the OG does not have to be sweet and kind yes, to you. Yes. The fact that Rakim is and Chuck D is and Kane is and all of this stuff, it doesn't mean the KRS owes me anything. No, not at all. So if I'm going there to kiss the ring, I kiss the ring. And if he accepts it lovingly, then that's beautiful for him. But he he doesn't owe me that. Of course. And he didn't. You know what I'm saying? You know, to be fair, I grabbed him. He was walking, and we were on Rock the Bells together for, like, year after year. And I had the feel there were rumblings that this was going to be the last Rock the Bells. And so I'm like, I have to tell him, you know. And so he was rushing to and from places, and finally I just, he's, you know, I'm six feet. He's, like, at least a half a foot taller than yeah. me. He's a big man. So like I grabbed his shoulders and I was like, please, please let me talk to you. And he wasn't, he wasn't nice to me, but uh, you know, I kissed the ring and uh, you know, it's, so it's interesting that to hear D nice talk about having a strained relationship with him and feeling like KRS, like, you know, I resented him for Scott's death. And yes. then, but that he's talked about how they sat down and they, they reconciled and they talked things out. There's such a like, man, the, the thing that's beautiful about this culture to me is that is is black manhood, like black masculinity is is really on display in hip hop in a way that's really beautiful. And I would say all, everything that I'm saying boils down to that. There's a certain element of black manhood that you catalog and, and nobody else has done it like that. For So for our generation... Yeah, man, you're one of the most important people in this culture to man, me. By I don't my even know how to, I, yo, I don't even know how to handle that. You man. want let me, be, let me get let me get caught up in the scandal tonight. <laughs> no, yeah, no, because the, yeah, right. No, it doesn't matter. But but I'm saying this like because there's a record now. Right, there's right. a record of these men sitting with you and being very vulnerable and human, and that can never that will never leave. You know what I'm saying? So, like, we know the blues because this man, Alan Lomax, yes. like, went through the South. And, and that's the only reason we heard Sun House. We never would have known who Sun House was. Alan Lomax was, worked with the, the Smithsonian Institute, I think. And he went all the way through the South with a, with a recorder and sat on people's porches and, and, you know, got the blues music. And otherwise, we wouldn't have heard it, you know. And, and this, is a oral, this is a, a, a oral catalog, you know what I'm saying? A oral history of this joint. It's very, very important. Man, I'll tell you, though, man, when I first started this thing, man, this thing was just like me and a group of my peoples who gathered together. I didn't care if we had, like, listeners or not. This was not a business venture, but this was, like, very therapeutic to me. Mm-hmm. And then we, when we started getting guests, like, like rest in peace, like our very first guest, man, Sean, Sean Price. Price. Mm-hmm. Like, when we started getting mm-hmm. guests. Yeah. And then the weight. It's not a yeah. weight. Yeah. But the responsibility and the freedom of this thing is, like, you know, I'm a fan. Right. Of this culture. Yeah. I'm able to speak to people like yourself mm. or like a Chuck D or like a LL or like a Jean Grey, like people that I appreciate. As LL a fan. was a human. LL was a dude when he sat down on his couch. He came in as LL. <laughs> yeah, baby. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Look at the yeah, yeah, yeah. But there were moments <laughs> where he was where he was like Todd. Right. There was there was moments of Todd and I've never saw or heard Todd before. And then I remember at this one point, he did this, like, super crazy laugh. You remember that? Yeah, he was, he was, he was like, like ah, you're scaring me with your laugh. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and what I think happened is that he realized, like, oh, snap. I'm being vulnerable. I was, I've been Todd for, like, an hour. You know what I'm saying? And I think that was him, like, taking it back right, right, almost. Right, right, right. You know what I'm mm. saying? And, um, yeah, man, it's a beautiful thing. That's crazy, man. Listen, you have a new album coming yes, out sir. on uh, May 5th. Mm-hmm. All the beauty in this whole life. Mm-hmm. Um. That's a lot for a title, man. Mm-hmm. 
Like, can can you explain that to us, man? So, I, you know, I've been make I've been putting out music for 15 years. Uh, well, my demo tape came out 17 years ago in 2000, um, and you know, I've gone through a lot of different periods. And the this particular one, you know, I, basically the way that I make music is that I live life, and a lot of times we have these transitional periods in life because there's almost like a death uh, of part of our life, and so it forces us to grow. And so I had a um, you know, another one of those. And then as I process it, once I've started processing things and I start writing songs about different parts of what I'm going through and what I'm experiencing and I'm able to like think them out and lay them out in a song, find the music that really fits the mood and then figure out how do I want to explain what's going on inside my heart. And over the last uh, few years, um, you know, I, I just kind of was like, man, I don't even know if I really still want to be doing this. Why? Mm, I mean, it's a lot of things. I, I mean, I think that I'm 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 not made to be uh, in the music industry. I don't care much about business in general. I don't care much about competing with other people. I don't but, care but, much but about. Let, let me interrupt you for a second, man. Like, what I like about the brother Ali brand is you've been in this industry for 17 years. Mm -hmm. um, you've left an indelible impression on me in terms of what you mean to me in this culture. Like, I don't give a fuck if the next 10 people know about you or not. You've left an indelible impression on me. So even today, like, people ask me, like, who are you interviewing tonight? And a couple of people, I said, I'm, I'm interviewing B Brother Ali. And they were like, who? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you don't know. Like, you don't know. And it, it, it wasn't like me having to explain. It's like, it's fucked up that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And, and, um, it's weird, man, you know, because when you say these things, it's I, I know what it sounds like. I've heard artists talk about the fact that they think they should be more known or whatever. Right. And it's not necessarily that. Um, and, you know, I get tweets every day that like, you know, most underrated. Da, 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 da. And I think but that might be true. These motherfuckers don't know how. Yo, listen, listen, Internet. <laughs> I'm not saying this because this man is on the show today, but you have to listen to undisputed truth you have to listen to the new album all the beauty in this whole life like this man spits this like this man paid dues to be this dope so i don't give a fuck if you ever heard about him or not this man like he brings me joy mm. and you bring me joy when i listen to this that's, shit. That's and to everything. me i think that's like it's crazy when i left the music industry mm -hmm. proper mm -hmm. when i left the music industry proper in 2003 in 2004 i was late to the game but i discovered the internet and the person that saved my life, like like my top five MCs, I categorize, categorize them in my top five because they saved my life. Right. So if I go back to like the 80s when I was in law school and I was dealing with them crazy people at Georgetown Law and I was mm. losing my mind because law school, was, the pressure was crazy and the whole mm, nine, mm, mm, mm. I would listen to Criminal Minded. Mm -hmm. and, and, and KRS gave me that. Like, you got this. That's you know what right. I'm saying? Like, like when shit was crazy in the night and I would listen to Ready to Die, mm. Biggie, you know what I'm saying? Like in the in, when I was in the industry and I was trying to be a savage, mm. Jay-Z saved my life. So when I was out of the industry, mm -hmm. when I when I left the industry, I was like, I don't want to hear rap anymore because I couldn't understand how shit was being so dumbed down. Right. And when I heard Doom, I was like, yo. Yeah. You save my That's life right. again. You you you, you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So when I hear a brother Ali, it's like Doom took me on tour too. He's another one. Yeah. Some of the greatest rappers are like, you know. Yeah. So, but when I, I when I mentioned brother, it it you you refreshed my passion mm. about this game. So the thing about being a rap fan is, and you know this because mm. you've been a rap fan for a long time. Your favorite MCs don't have to be the most popular MCs as Never. much as they mean that much to you. That's right. I remember OC, was it OC? Time's up. Like He said, I'd rather be broke and have a whole lot of respect. Who Jews. would say such a thing nowadays? Like, who would ever utter such a phrase at this moment? You know what I mean? Who would ever say that? <laughs> but that's the way we felt. You know, and, and I, I, yeah, so I just kind of felt like with the music and, like, with the industry and, like, all of this stuff. Even when I got on the plane to come out here, man, there's, like, a, a weird feeling that I had where I'm like, man, I'm about to go to New York for a press, you know, a press run. Is this a press run? It is a press run. This is a press run. Like, one of the things I vow not to do, man, is a press not run. to do press runs. Yeah. Is this a fucking press run, Ali? It is, but it's been... The show's it's, over, man. Let's go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how far has Minnesota? 
It's I fun. mean, it's fun, man. So when you come to New York. No, no, I'm gotta, fucking with you, uh, man. Yeah, but but yeah. I just like this past week, I just did my rap, my my podcast, Ten Commandments. I was like, no press run. Yeah. But I would never consider you. No, I mean, press. you and I have been talking for a long yes, time. Sir. So I mean, this is not no. And and honestly, we anchored this trip around seeing you. Thank you, man. Yeah, no, that was the first thing that I told. And I mean, these guys will attest that like when we said let's go to New York, I said I have to sit with Reg because that's we've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, but but, really but, but the you. thing is, man, going back to what you said, man, I think. You know, to be to be consistently dope mm. and the question, like the ex- ex- existential question as to whether you're industry or not, but still be consistent, consistently dope. I mean, that's the win, right? And, and even beyond Isn't just that the win, even it, it to a degree. But it's almost like so. I, so the, the way that I felt is not only with the industry, but even with the whole notion of like other people appreciating and, and celebrating you, right. me. You know what I mean? So even with my, 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 you know, little corner of fans, I had this feeling where I'm like, man, am I, am, have I become the person that entertains them? And how much of impact is that having on the way that I live my life? And how much impact does that have on what I'm saying? Cause the last album that I made um, five years ago, five years ago. Yeah. Well, but I put out three in that time. Okay. So it was like, I, I had a, EP called Bite Marked Heart, which is all about songs about like relationship stuff. And then me and Jake one did the album that's like very political. That's right. And then me and Jake one also did a mixtape where I'm just spitting over his beats called Left in the Deck. So we did three. It's five years ago, but we did three albums in that year. So it's, you know, but it's like, you know, I made that album thinking like, okay, I got all these fans and they come from like the dominant culture. And obviously they're coming to hip hop because they want to learn something and they want to reconnect with a missing part of their humanity that like the the idea of whiteness stole from them. And that's why they're here. So I made this album that was like trying to invite them to take it a step further and say like, okay, you're, you're, you're picking up missing pieces of your heart from dealing with this black genius culture. So would you like to see some changes in the world re- related to that and would you be willing to step up and actually do something that's like an invitation to activism and organizing that album and i realized like man you know i so i did that album and you know there, there some of the response was really great a, a lot of people just were kind of like ah, i'll get you on the next one um which is their right to do but there was a degree to which i started like thinking to myself is this really like is this who i've become is it like, do I make art like I'm so so I'm no longer reporting just what's going on in my heart. And now I'm making this like this like album inviting people to do this political thing. And, um, you know, so I, so I just had a period where I was just kind of questioning it all. And I ended up uh, like really going into the spiritual tradition of Islam, which they call Sufism and sitting with. I've been very blessed where like every time I'm interested in something, the best people open their arms to me and it's just the creator doing that. And the same thing happened, you know? And so I would travel, start traveling around the world and just sitting with these like spiritual masters. And every single one of them was like, you have to make music, go and make music. You have to make music. Yeah. That's that's your life's work. Right. And I started. And and the thing that I learned to make pizza, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, like no, all these pizzas. Like, what the fuck are you gonna do? Hey, my I mean, and, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not. Crazy. I'm not telling you not to dream your dreams. And, if and you have greater dreams, but dreams. but what from what I get <laughs> from your music mm. is that that's your life's work. I, yeah, I believe that too. What? Well, so for me, my life's work is connecting with people. Yes. And so through like, your music. Well, music is one of the ways. But I'm saying I also. I don't talk about this, man. But this is what you come here for, right? Of course. Um, but I mean, I have people who look to me for their their both their spirituality and their politics right and is there are people that i kind of you know um i don't want to say under my wing because it's a partnership it's like a it's a it's a it's a friendship so we study together and we seek together and we grow together and we reflect together but i mean people come to me and either you know learn about um you know and, and really explore how to be active in society and things like that and then people come to me and become muslim uh, or with sometimes they don't actually convert, but just talking and reflecting about the spiritual path is beneficial to both of us, you know. Um, and so that for me is enough. Right. You know, to me, I want to feel connected with people. Right. And I want to feel like I'm benefiting and being and, and that I'm being benefited and I'm also benefiting people. And I, that's what really is the reason that I really do it. 
And so I, I, there was a time when I was like, man, I don't necessarily have to be on the mic. And I don't like asking people to mess with me. I really don't like that. And it's probably because, you know, growing up being albino, a lot of people just straight rejected me, like very harshly. And so there's a part of me that's like, I never asked a woman out. I never tried to get anybody to mess with me that does not mess with me. And um, and, there, and I, there's an element to to promotion and self-promotion and all this kind of stuff. It's like, hey, look at me. Please like me. Like literally like click like on this thing. Like me, like me. I'm not, I, I, you know what I'm saying? But basically these, these like masters that I sat with them, like, please help me go down, go travel on the spiritual path to the center of who I am and back home to who I really am and connected to the creator and connected to the world of the life of meaning. These people basically told me like, that's what, that's what you do, yeah. you know? And it's actually one of my teachers said it's bad manners with God for the creator to put you in a situation. And he said, how many times did you pray? How many times in your life did you pray to have an audience and to be able to feed your family with your music? And you know what I mean? And now you have it. And now you've decided that you're too spiritual to do this. Yo, you, you're, you're terrible. I, man. I, I got to interrupt you because yeah. you just fucked me up. And I'm about to share some shit that I've never shared on. The Allah, 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 Allah. Um, I've been a practicing Buddhist mm -hmm. for the past 27 years. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the Buddhist world, I'm very responsible for sharing because I've had a lot of experiences with people that are coming into like learning about enlightenment and spiritualism and what their spirituality is and, and the whole nine. But I've also learned in Buddhism that, you know, you work very hard to get the sense of like enlightenment, consciousness, compassion, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean anything. Like, like when I hear about the traditional Buddhist monks mm -hmm. that go into the mountains and it's, it's like, and I'm, it's not disrespecting, but it's like, you got to come back into the muddy swamps, mm -hmm. which is what, you know, Buddhism, like the symbol of Buddhism is a lotus flower because mm -hmm. the lotus flower is one of the rarest, most beautiful flowers that grows out of a muddy swamp. And what represents the muddy swamp other than, you know, society as we know it. Mm -hmm. And so I go into this world, but it, I feel like it'd be so selfish for me mm -hmm. to get all this enlightenment and personal benefit and not come back. Right into this muddy swamp mm -hmm. that is society, that is fucking hip hop. And mm -hmm. so I've been fortunate enough to, 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 to realize through the work that I do through the combat jack show that that is my life's work. I don't have to change Absolutely shit. Absolutely not. I don't have to hold back. I can fucking, I'm fucking drunk right now, internet. No, no, I'm not drunk. I'm drunky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drunky, but I'm still doing my life's work mm -hmm. because that's what being a human is, right? Mm -hmm. Like, especially when, you know your lowest of your lows, and you also know your highest of your highs, and you embrace all of that shit. It's like, I want to share just a little bit with everybody. That's right. And you could be a fucked up, flawed human being and be like the highest of the high, be it in tune with Allah, be it in tune with God, be it in tune with, in tune with Jehovah, being a Buddha. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what it is. Like, yeah. you have to shit your drawers right. to be fucking enlightened. You, 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 well, you, you know what I mean? People. Mm. Yeah, to be able to help people, you right. have to have been through something. People have to be able to identify with you. Right. Mm. And you have to know what it feels like to be jacked up. Yes. Because if you don't know that, then, then you can't then help the next person. You can't help. So I'm so saying, let, so there are some me, people let me, that. Let me interrupt you. Let yes, me interrupt sir. you. No, I also ahead. believe that mm. whatever you believe in, right. you get fucked up on your path because when you come out of that, the next person that's fucked up in the same way will not believe anybody else. But you, if you had not walked right. in those shoes. Yeah. So some people achieve enlightenment, but they did not go through, They, you know. Of course. But they didn't go through the, 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 the muck to get there. Hey, hey, King, is this too much, man, for our audience? Like, like you fucky bergs. Y'all understand what the fuck? Yo, where else they going to get this? <laughs> like, where else they going to get this we, work, we, man? We talk about like. Uh, like Yo, they're not going to get this talk nowhere <laughs> else. <laughs> Yeah, Yo, no, you have to. So, so, this, so they're saying Kleenex. fuck y'all so y'all can fuck with us. Right, Make sure right, you right. rate, subscribe, and comment. <laughs> right, Talk right, to right. brother, at brother Ali, yeah. at Radio Say. Yeah. 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 World star. Yeah. So the, <laughs> World star. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm saying, so there are people that do get there. Yes. There are two, there are people that the creator does bring there, mm. but, but they, they are of a different status if they haven't been through something crazy. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's what it is about Malcolm. That speaks to us so much. But because Malcolm was went through so much. That's what I'm saying. That's the like thing about Malcolm. Malcolm spoke is like, to like yeah. the common man because he was fucking what Malcolm Little. 
Red. I mean, Detroit Red, Satan. Detroit Red, yeah. They call that brother Satan yeah. in the prison. But those are the people mm. that, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's crazy, man. I'm going through this situation right now, man, where um, I'm working on this Chris Lighty project, and we just mm. came across some things where we show that he's really flawed. Mm -hmm. And some people on the team are like, yo, is, wasn't he a fucked up person? Like, did you lose respect for him? I'm like, no. Mm. Like, he was flawed, but all of us are flawed. Like, I'm not going to yeah. besmirch that man's name because we found some things that might not be acceptable to the, you know whoever wants to judge it's like i i i can't judge another person for what fucked up shit they did because we all do bad things but not all of us are bad people you, you know you know what i mean yeah man and it's not a you know you know it's not a it's not a license so these are things that we that this is the this is the attitude after we've made mistakes this yes. is not a license to like go headlong into you know, foulness, right. you know what I mean? Like, like it's to be avoided at all costs yeah. at all. You know what I'm saying? At, at whatever expense is required. But the reality is that, you know, and one of my teachers said, um, you know, a mistake, one mistake that a servant makes that lets them know how, how needy we are of the divine of the creator is better than a thousand good deeds that we attribute to ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and a sign that when we make a mistake, uh, and we feel just completely like devastated that like I'm, I messed up and I did what I wasn't supposed to do. This, if if we feel completely devastated by that, that's a sign that all of the good that we're doing, we're attributing to ourselves. Right. And so sometimes there are people who are meant to become a saint and the thing that would veil them uh, and stop them and hold them back from doing that is the fact that they have never made a mistake. And so, you know, they, they, they move along the path of attributing it all to themselves, which is the complete you know, opposite of goal is, you know, completely. Yo, Ali, I don't want to run goal. with nobody that's never made a mistake, man. Mm. Right. I don't trust anyone mm. in my circle mm -hmm. that's never fallen. Mm -hmm. Cause then I'm like, I don't trust you because then you, there's a certain sense of arrogance. There's a certain sense of disconnect from other people's humanity. Mm. If you're so locked in, like, cause, cause what drives me, I mean, I'm not taking anything away from people that have never made mistakes, mm. but the sense of, self-importance self sense of arrogance self superiority disconnects you from humanity mm. you got to fuck up right. to be a true human and to be a fucking god or a buddha or to be in tune with you know you know I'll, you know what i'm saying it's like yeah. you got to fuck up to be great you know I, you know i believe in prophets i do believe that prophets are real right. and i do believe that prophets uh are are the very special case of people who don't right and but I, but but even jesus Mm. Let's talk about Jesus, the most celebrated "quote unquote" prophet, right? Mm -hmm. He flipped over some tables, b. Right, but yeah, he cursed some motherfuckers. He was like, "Get the fuck out of here!" Right, like he lost his temper, which you're not supposed to do as a "quote unquote" Christian, right? Mm. Like, right, right, well, like. Well, I mean, I mean, as uh, or God's son. Mm. Like, where are we going with this? Are we? <laughs> welcome to the combat jack welcome to the yeah, combat yeah, yeah. jack show. no i mean you know and I, I personally i don't see that as a i don't see that as a mistake or right. i don't see that as a, a but sin it's, as it's, it were it's, it's, it's as i mean that's righteous it's, indignation it's, it's as human as he could be too right right no it, it is very right. human yeah and because doesn't that counter turn the other cheek like if, no, we, if we i don't think so no i don't think it does because you know when the, you the, chase motherfuckers out Right, when you're but, flipping tables and like yeah. get the fuck out of here. Yeah, no, there is a time for that. So basically, uh, there's this there's this great one of the greatest Muslim saints of all time is called Imam Al Ghazali, and Imam Wait, Al Ghazali again, Ghazali Gonzali. <laughs> Was he Hispanic? He like, <laughs> Elio, Elio Gonzalez. Elio, yo, you got to say that a little slow, man. Ghazali. How do you I, like like G A G A Z A Z A Zapoli L L I. Ghazali. 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 Okay, yeah, not Ghazali. Like a gazelle. Okay, so there's yeah. no, like the V would make him Hispanic. No, I'm being racist right now, but hey, Damn, combat, hey you're welcome to combat. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but so Imam Ghazali says. Ghazali. Yeah, Ghazali. Yeah, one of the greatest, one of the greatest, um, you know, one of the greatest in the Islamic tradition. This was a person who mastered the outward law. So like he mastered the Sharia and he was a teacher of it. And he was like famous. Like he was like the Kanye West of like preaching. And he hit a point where he realized that everything he was doing was all serving his own ego. Yes. And he said, I don't want to ever talk to anybody ever again. And so he moved away to where nobody lived. Oh, and also he got robbed. Um, got and jacked. he had gone to, yeah, he got jacked. What did he get so he, jacked for? He, wait, for, he went to another place and he wanted to like, get their books. 
and you have to copy out the books by hand. So he comes back with this camel load full of books that are copied by hand, and and he gets hit. He gets hit for his books. Well, yeah, and they, and, they, and they took the book. Well, he begged the man. He said, please don't take my books. He said, take all the money, take all the other stuff, because he's a rich, famous man. Like, this is when scholars and saints were like the rock stars of their time. And he said, like, take everything you want, but don't take the books. He said, why? He said, because all my knowledge is in these books. And the man said, what is it really, though, if I can take it? If a person like me take can take you the most precious thing object, that you have, right. then what is it really? And so he had this experience that they call a Ghazalian crisis, where he started to realize that, like, I'm not necessarily, my ego is taking this information and I'm just teaching it to people instead of become transformed by it. Because the ego doesn't want to be transformed. It wants to duck and dodge. And so he realized that that's what he was doing. So he went away and he just, he went to a mosque in a place where nobody recognized his face, but they knew his name. And he just swept the mosque for years and years and years. And he actually lost his voice. So he, so, you know, he couldn't speak. It's like Game of Thrones, man. It's real though. And so... He's at Ari, one point he, he thought Starks, man. he thought I might be ready. And he said, I think I'm ready to go back and teach again. I think that my ego has been disciplined. You know, I've gone to being nobody. I think I'm ready to teach again. And then he overheard two people having a religious debate. And one of them said, no, but Ghazali said so and so. And he got like a little flutter of like, that's right. I'm that dude. So, no, I'm clearly not ready kept sweeping with sweeping the mosque for years. And then finally he comes back and his voice returns to him. And, um, you know, when he speaks, people just are in tears. But, you know, so, so, uh, but Imam Ghazali says about when you're talking about Jesus flipping the tables, he said, uh, uh, anger is a necessary part of being a human being. So he said, you know, we don't want our anger to be out of control. So the way he said it is anger is like a hunting dog. If you don't train a hunting dog, when he goes to get the rabbit or the bird or whatever, he'll bite his throat and like completely destroy it. But if you if you train a hunting dog for what do you go for to grab something just enough so that you are able to bring it back? You know what I'm saying? So that's the way that the, the anger just needs to be trained. It's elevated anger. So um, it's, it's righteous indignation. It's righteous indignation. So when I when I read about, you know, Jesus, people upon him flipping over tables because these people brought money and business, they're, they're doing the religion for business purposes, for their own, like, personal gain. It's capitalism. Yeah. So I'm, I, so the, I take that as, like, that's a very prophetic thing. And when people like Dr. King and Dr. Cornell West are talking about prophetic Christianity, that's where they get that from. The whole civil rights is, movement is based on Jesus because of flipping the table over and because of the fact that he was on that. You know what I'm saying? So I see, I see that as, a, as prophetic perfection, that he, he mastered his anger. So where he does have anger, but but it's a you know it's a beautiful thing. I I, I don't I don't know what the next question should be. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. All right, listen, man. Um, your last album, "Morning in America" and "Dreaming in Color," you kind of mourn the decline of um, American consciousness, but you also spoke for this country's disenfranchised and hope for a brighter future. Right? This was five years ago. Where the fuck are we right now, dude? Like, 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 like you spoke, like there was the sense of despair, Mm -hmm. the sense of like, let's speak about the evils of the world, but also like we had a whole different climate and it was about hopeful, like where the fuck are we right now, Ali? Hmm. Yeah, it's very bad. It's very, very bad. It's, it's also, you know, there's a bright side. Of course. You know. Of course. And, and I think my thing is always to like think. Like, what's the next step? So everybody's on one thing. So I'm always kind of like, well, what's the next, what's the next step? You know what I mean? And like, where do we go from here? Um, So, you know, during the time when I put that album out, that was the Obama time. And you have like, you know, Obama, the, so like in England, they have the prime minister that does the, the, the laws and the rules and actually runs the government. And then they have a queen or a king. That's the like symbolic leader. Obama in America is the, all in one person. Yes. So like as a symbolic leader, maybe the best ever, probably that hey, got to I mean, be the best I, I, ever. I say, you know, for all pros and cons mm. that Obama was the Jay-Z of our presidents. Hmm. I mean, if you, you know, if you buy into the, I mean, in the, the, the legacy of Jay-Z. Yeah. And I, I love Jay-Z. I, he's in my top five for sure. But you know, policy wise, he did horrible things. Of I mean, course. Is I, like, mean but, I mean, isn't that, rec- I mean, think about it when you're the American president, and you and and you have to run this corporation mm-hmm. efficiently. Mm-hmm. Part of it comes with doing some horrible things. I mean, that's that's unless unless you really want to. 
I mean, raise the consciousness mm -hmm. and go deeper, which I don't think we're ready for. And I want to talk about the concept of the album right now, but he did his job. You know, he, he elevated a lot of things that, um, he, he, he did a lot of things that Bush could never have imagined doing. Right. And that, and that's kind of my thing is like you know nobody knows what it's like to be in that seat nobody knows the conversations and the realities nobody that nobody knows the bodies that you have to bury yeah in that seat which is like let's keep it real yeah I mean you know so I don't know what he's facing I right. I don't know but I do know that I would have you know I went out and knocked on doors and did all that whole thing I would have loved to see him fight yeah I didn't I didn't see him fight I I would even if you're gonna fight and lose. I would have liked to see him really fight, and I'd never, I don't feel like I ever saw him really fight for anything. And I give him the benefit of the doubt for not fighting because he knew he was the first one, and because of the color of his skin, mm -hmm. every day he is knew a fight. how things might have been obstructed or might have been made more difficult, right? If he fought, obviously, because you know we we let's call it what it is, man. Like a lot of people wrote him, wrote him off as being the black president right. or the black people's president. Mm -hmm. He went out of his way to prove, like, no, I am the American people's president, mm -hmm. which is a difficult tightrope to walk mm -hmm. when you're a black man. But, I mean, black people are part of America. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course, but a lot of America don't. A lot of America. They ain't trying to hear that. They, they, you right. got you got to appease the masses. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not, like I said, like, I know. Like, at, at the end of the day, man, he came from those, the most ruthless school of politics, which was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So your man... Like he fought with switch switchblade. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. he mastered the art of politics. Yeah. So I don't idealize him in terms of like him being the savior as much as like, yo, you're a fucking trained professional in terms of being a president. Yeah. And as a symbolic. And, and, and you know, that's a, that's a weird com that's a weird it, yeah. thing to say. Yeah. But as an American president, he fucking did his job. I mean, but there there have been presidents. Now, granted, they're not up against what he's up against. Yes. So when I say he didn't fight I mean, his very existence is a fight. Yes. Like him, like, I mean, Just, look where we are right now. Yeah, right. Where we are right now is a result of him, even if he was a fuck up. Mm -hmm. Where we are right now is a result of his, the color of his skin. And I, I don't think that he was messing up. I think he was good at doing bad things as yes. long as he, as he was, well as he was. very he was good at doing bad things. Yeah. But he did with a certain element of class and, and you know what I'm saying? And yeah. dignity. We have had presidents that have fought. Yes. I mean, Jimmy Carter fought. Jimmy Carter fought, and 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 it's unfortunate that. And I mean, like, I love Jimmy Carter, like, and I'm old enough to remember mm. Jimmy Carter's presidency. Yeah, but that also I think hurt Jimmy Carter in the long run because people are like, yo, he's not that. Serious. You know what I'm saying? It's like he didn't get real. He, 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 it's it's just like had Bernie mm. won, and a lot of people had a lot of hope in Bernie, mm. but Bernie's vision was to too high for our country's consciousness where it is. You, you know what I mean? Hmm. Where they can cast, because it's like you're not in the... Anyway, let me let me, let me me get to what I really want to talk about. Yeah, please. The theme of your album right now, um, the theme of some of your prior albums was really looking outward at the, at the ills of American society. But um, I've read some of your interviews with regards to this album, and you're like, you know, this album is looking inward. Mm -hmm. Because, like, once again, as a Buddhist, like, you have to look inward. That's right. You have to acknowledge what's going on inside of you you have mm -hmm. to change the things inside of you before you can effectuate external change mm -hmm. this society is not ready for that like I, I i had hope like like i, I remember it to, um 9 11 um when the country was quote unquote attacked and i had this hope that we would look inward to see, well, what the fuck did we do to cause this? Because that's, that's right. That's, that's, you know, when something yeah. happens to you, you have to take accountability for that. Mm -hmm. Even if you didn't, in your mind, cause that immediately. Like, what did I do to attract that? That's right. And so I had this, like, kind of like this childish hope that we would look inward. Of course we were going to war. I knew that's America. But at least, like, what did we... And there was none of that. Mm -mm. Um, and this album talks about it. Can we talk about, like... Yeah, I mean... Um, the spirituality and the consciousness and the... The elevated sense of looking inward mm -hmm. to cause outward change. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's been a part of of all of the the very the really effective like movements. There's always a spiritual element of it that is not based on identity. That like it's my team against this team, it's my team against their team, and I'm on my side just because it's me. You know what I mean? 
but that there are certain virtues that that animate us and certain virtues that root us um and and so you know it's not we're not interested in beating somebody at their own game like beating somebody at their own game is just the most glorified way of losing you know um the idea is to you know be firmly rooted in who we are and in truth and in beauty and in justice and love you know and um so you know that's that's the approach that i personally needed to take because i realized that in a lot of the activisms and stuff like that you know you know when somebody's just trying to make a billion dollars they they're very clear about the fact that like this is just about me and my ego like i'm on some narcissist get money right now get money f you know what i'm saying like f everybody i'm here to get mine those people are very clear about their mission and that the fact they're driven by their ego what's more difficult and a lot more challenging to navigate is when you when we when we say i'm going to actually try to do some good in this world the ego is like really sneaks in there stealthy like a ninja that then starts to take over everything that we're doing um because and, you're powered by the sense of self-righteousness not necessarily like i don't think that's where it starts out but i think that that, that it it requ- there needs to be some sort of spiritual tradition of wisdom that includes elders that can see us in a way that we can't see ourselves so i understand when people are like well i don't want to organize religion I'd really get that. I really understand that because there's a lot of problems that come along with it. The only thing, the only like pushback that I would have is that if we are just charting our own course, then our course is as limited as we are because we're veiled. Like all of us are veiled by all types, all types of things that we have going inside of us. So if we don't have some sort of mentor or we don't have some sort of guide or we don't have some sort of, you know, loving elder that's at least a couple of steps ahead of us in the path that's kind of checking in with us and allowing us to really look at where we're at. It's really difficult. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's obviously a, a really important part of, uh, you know, of any type of work to really establish good is that it has to start within and emanate from there. Um, and so that's the place that I was at where, You know, we see people go into something good. And I think it's easy for people to start out with really amazing intentions. But if we're not really aware of our hearts in a way that lets us know that like... You're not constantly checking yourself. Yeah, and being checked. Instead of checking others. That's right. being checked. Yeah. And, And that's what's so like... That's one of the most dangerous things, in my opinion, about this Starting administration. Off with the right in- intention. Well, the intention well, is well, I everything. Don't know about this, I don't know about this administration. Well, okay, so this administration, one of the most things that's most dangerous about it that I'm seeing from my peer group and people younger than me, like my nieces and nephews, is that it, they're so evil, they're so outwardly evil, that it's really like yummy to, and, to externalize evil and be like, all the evil is on that side. Right. And I'm on the I'm with the good guys. I'm clearly with the good team. And so there's no system of checking. There's no system of checking ourselves. And we can only check ourselves to a degree. So, you know, what I'm saying we need somebody who is who's walked that path. We need elders. We need uh, mentors. We need guides. So the poet Rumi says that everybody thinks the sword is the is the, the blade. People think of the sword. They think of the blade because that's the part that cuts. But a, a blade by itself is completely worthless because you can't hold a blade in your hand. It needs a handle. So a sword can't carve its own handle, no matter how strong it is. You know what I'm saying? It needs a completed sword to be able to carve the handle so that it can complete the, the sword. You know what I'm saying? And um, I think that's one of the things when we just throw out these words like, I don't want organized religion. You know what I'm saying? Or I'm not going to be part of any kind of like you know, group or like uh, communal kind of like spiritual process is that we lose that. We lose that uh, ability for somebody who sees us and lovingly can like help us guide al- guide us along that path. And that's one of the things that that my our generation and younger, we're really losing that, man. And But, but the reason is because we've been violated. Like our trust has been violated. People that are in authority that were supposed to look out for us, too many of them have violated it. And so we're having a really deep, like crisis, like we're in a very, very deep crisis with that stuff. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you related to this is I've learned, you know, at a young age that one of the tools of evil or the people that utilize evil for their benefit is when they can look, when they can point to a group of people and say, those are the monsters. Mm -hmm. They're not human. They're evil. Mm -hmm. Those are the bad guys. So we, we have the opportunity and the luxury of taking away their humanity, yeah. right? 
But I find myself looking at this administration and being like, yo, every day these motherfuckers wake up and they're like, yo, how can we out evil the shit that we do the next day? Mm -hmm. So it's very e easy for me to look at this administration and be like, all you motherfuckers are evil. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's obviously. Mm -hmm. The devils. It, it's like, like the devil. evil machine. Mm -hmm. But then I have to question even like that consciousness in me. Like when I categorize everybody in this administration as evil, Am I not doing the same thing? Right, and that's the thing. I mean, you, and which is which, which is fucked up because these motherfuckers are obviously doing evil. Right, outwardly. I like, mean, every no, day, no like shame, like every no day, bad, like yeah. we're gonna cut funding to Sesame Street. How fucking much more evil right. can you be? Right. Yeah, yeah. You just out here. You, <laughs> I mean, like you know what I'm saying. You out here just you want to kill Big Bird, Big Bird, yo? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Like a bye, like a bye, mother. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, the homie from uh, New Jack City jumping out the jeep like ha, ha. just big bird. Yeah. So, it. so how do I check myself from label like like absolving myself? Right. Yeah. From evil by putting it all on this fucking orange haired motherfucker, man. Yeah. And that's the thing that I'm saying. But you know it from being a Buddhist. Like that's the thing about having mentors is that you know one of one of my teachers when I first met him, I was sitting telling him all this all this organizing and activism and radical stuff and he said you know he's in his 70s he said um i used to be really radical like you he said i also used to be fat and you know what i'm saying and i'm a you know heavy guy i was just like eh. shout out to the you know and he said uh, i realized that i wasn't able to even be just with myself right you know what i'm saying i wasn't able to 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 treat myself properly every time my ego wanted some pie or whatever i just went and handled that you know what i'm saying that I wasn't able to to balance that within myself. You know, so that's what I'm saying. Like, it's so easy to to look at other people and and um, not realize the role that our own ego is playing in that and how much the ego loves it that. It feels so good. Because not only is the devil the ego, uh, uh, the, the, the enemy, but the, the, our ego is like, that's the way that the devil gets to us. That's the IV. Dude, I've never felt so good on shitting on somebody as much as I feel as good as shitting on Trump. Yeah. I mean, it's hella easy. I mean, it's so no, easy. There's no dude. shortage of like, <laughs> and he deserves it. But it's like, yo, like, am I, at what point do I play a role in this? I mean, the same way that like, in 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 terms of personality, Obama was like all of the 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 beautiful, dignified aspects of of the black community are like projected onto this family. You know what I'm saying? He is the 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 prince and the you know, and his wife is the the princess. And his children are the, you know, the heirs yes. of black dignity and, and beauty and, and regality and royalty. And, you know, this this is very like gallant man and this very, you know, beautiful. Elegant queen. Elegant. Yeah, man. To the to the utmost. When and we go low, we go high. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, like who is who's who's messing with that? Yeah, nobody. Nobody. So that's a projection of like all of the all of that, those traits in the black community. Trump is like the and I, I hate saying his name. I should. But P -Mert. this man. You know, this devil that's that is he is all of the negativity in this in this culture yes. and in this society. You know, I mean, we've been teaching all of the stuff that he's doing for how long? You know what I mean? Long like we've been bro. teaching people yeah. that like it's all about winning. And that's what I'm saying. And I feel at like all costs, you know what I'm saying? Like, at all costs. And and we so I'm saying how many times, though, are we talking to 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 our brothers and they're doing things that are destroying themselves and destroying other people? And we're like, hey, man, I'm not mad at you. You're getting your money. You know what I'm saying? And at no point do we say, um, you know, I, I, I feel you, I understand, and there's, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I also believe that we are better than, and that you're better than so, this. So basically, Trump is a manifestation of all of our collective darkness? Absolutely. Yeah. I can't be anything but. Can't be anything but. Huh. I want to quote you on something, man. You said mm -hmm. something recently about um, how this might be the very first time in American history that Muslims... And members of the LGBTQ community have ever shared such a close alliance. Yes. And I want to talk about that because that's such a profound statement, man. And in a sense, you got to thank Trump yeah. for following true on his promise to bring Americans closer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is real, man. And I'm saying like, Okay, so so my family, we do, uh, on Monday nights, we celebrate the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, yes. right? Peace be upon him. And we had this thing where, like, there, there's a there's a there's um, these two women that open this donut shop called Glam Doll Donuts. It's like the super hip fly. But they're just I the homies. some Glam Doll. You, you, that's right, you did. Did they give you one with yes, your name on it? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm 
fat boy. Like I'm. <laughs> hey man, I'm saying man, there, there, there's a reason why me and you are so connected, man, on so many levels. Yes, sir. But yeah, so like they were the homies that were just like every time we'd have a party or something like that or a barbecue or something, they showed up with homemade donuts that were killing. They made a donut with the with the Combat Jack show. Yeah. Yo, King, they they had the cut, and I was like, uh, ah, I didn't even Instagram it. I was yeah, like, ah. I, I never saw a picture that means uh, they make it. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it take a long you know. time to get that phone. Uh, 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 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> on, anyway, on, so on camera. Yeah. So. Yo, yeah. So, so, um, you know, they got the hippest, like, flyest donut shop in the Twin Cities, right? Super. So we go there on Mondays, and you know, they never let us pay, but we always like get donuts, and we have a community of people come and gather at the crib. So super, um, like, you know, very outwardly uh, effeminate gay brother is like rings us up. And he's always like, well, I'm always like, come on, man, let me let me give you something like we're arguing. He's the homie. You know what I mean? We're arguing every single week. And he's like, get out of here. Get out of here. Bye. <laughs> Boy, bye. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so one day he says, hey, how come every Monday? What, what's up with Mondays that you guys always get like all these donuts? And I told him, I said, we're celebrating the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. And so he was like, oh, that's dope. He's like, can I come to one and all this kind of stuff? So then the following <laughs> Monday, I come back in. And, and it's me and my wife and my daughter in hijab. And we walk in. And this gay brother is like, yay, Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> Happy oh, birthday, Prophet man. Muhammad. You know what I'm saying? It's amazing, man. Yeah, man. It's like that, you know. And and there are so many, uh, you know, just t- just cases of that, of people, you know. I, I saw on the news where this this man and his family in Texas, you know, this this, you know, big white dude and his, and his family went to a mosque. Um, they had signs that said, we love Muslims. Uh, you know, his, they had a sign that were like, you're welcome here. This is your home. And his kids brought candy and they were giving candy to the Muslim kids. You know what I'm saying? Just post it up outside the mosque. You know, these are people that look like, like if I were to see them, I, I would think they would have voted for dude. Yeah. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So that's the flip side of this is that, you know, it is really causing a lot of people that I think were apathetic, especially people in the dominant culture, have to really start reexamining all of these things. And I think he's, I think that he is bringing like the idea of whiteness to the forefront for people to examine again so that certain people are really doubling down on it. But there are a lot of of, like European American people that are like, wait a minute, what's this whole white thing again? Like, what is it? What do I get out of this? You know what I'm saying? And like, what does this mean? Because for years you told me I was like superior and now I don't want to believe that anymore. I don't want to buy into this. I don't want to buy that. It's obviously not superior. This is the basis form of like, any humanity, regardless of what culture you, I mean, what what color you are, mm. and so it's, it's, it's kind of emba- like it's embarrassing if you're even the slightest form of elevated, right? Yeah, and so you got this whole generation of people having a straight like identity crisis because and you mentioned that like uh, European Americans are going through this identity identity crisis. Yeah, right absolutely, now. absolutely, and 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 it would have happened without. The student office. I think I think he really brought it to the forefront for a lot of people. I think that there was a lot of people that were just kind of on the fence and were very passively, um, you know, disapproving of things that now it's like, man. It's obvious. Yeah. I have to. I, th- there are people in the street now that have never gone out and, and protested before. I mean, you got these people, you know, in, in Seattle, for example, I was talking to the sister from Seattle and um, I've, I've had an apartment in Seattle and like that's that's one of my second homes, uh, you know. At their international airport, I, I can't remember how many people. I think I said there were upwards of 10,000 people, overwhelmingly white, at the airport greeting Muslims coming in, greeting people from Arab countries when coming in. When does that in, ever happen? Singing them songs and just freaking like, you know what I'm saying? Like just outpouring of love. Yeah. She said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, I mean, you know, there's just, there's just so many different layers to this thing. But but there's the the first battleground for fighting injustice is our own heart is our own heart and it's the most important battleground because if we don't win there then we're we're not winning we we were done yeah and so many people what i notice in like my niece and nephews our niece and nephews generation is that uh you know many of them their 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 like their, their their stances on politics and things like that are one of the ways that they show it is like cutting people off in their personal circle you know what i'm saying so it's saying like basically like, uh, you know, in, in white circles, I see like a lot of my white young homies that'll be like, you know, my dad's racist and I'm never talking to him again. Fuck my dad. You know what I'm saying? And then I see, uh, you know, my black nieces and nephews be like so-and-so, 
is a uh, um, you know a house whatever, and I'm I'm cutting them off. You know what I mean? It's so and so like, and that's so that's not taking, it. Right, right, right. You know because what I'm saying? Because it's so externalizing. Yeah, and I'm saying like, how does that how does that not serve the enemy to start untribing people? Start dividing like, people. You know what I'm saying? To start un- to start kicking people out of the, you know what I mean? So, yeah, there's just so many different ways that, like, like even this work of spirituality. And so people in the organizing, the activism and, and uh, you know, the, the, the justice world, it's easy for them to look at religion and be like, yo, these people, so many of them are hypocrites and they're self-righteous and they don't even see it and da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. But it's the same sneaky uh, you know, uh, acrobat yeah. ego that snuck its way in, and it, the same thing is happening. You know, in uh, in the world of politics and stuff too. All right, Ali, let's sell some records, man. Mm-hmm. Let's sell some records right now, man. Mm-hmm. Um, I listened to the album, man, and one of my favorite records on there is uh, Uncle Usi taught me. Yeah, and we'll get into we'll we'll get deeper into it, of course. But number one, man, your flow is so undeniable on that, man. Who produced that record? Ant did the whole album, really. Yeah, the, so. Ant produced it all, but there's a there's a guy that plays like that's all live instruments and, on and, there. And talk, talk, tell us about Ant. Yeah, man, Ant Anthony Davis, man, Anthony Jerome Davis. That's my big brother and uh, one Killed of it. my dearest friends, if not my dearest friend in the world. And this album is um, it as much as anything else, it's about our friendship, and it, and it's a really an album about friendship and love, and connection. You know, um, dude, you're a beast on that record, dude. <laughs> You're a fucking yeah, beast on that record, dude. Like, be your yeah. beast yeah. on Thank a fucking you. record, man. Thank you. But what I appreciate about it is not only are you killing it, like, with, with the delivery and the flow and just even you just extending beyond how, like, like I, like I said before when you came in, man, when I meet you, man, you're so dignified and you're so professorial, man. Man, I love making us worthy of our friends' when you're on compliments. this mic, man, it's like, yo, don't fucking fuck No, never that. This. Never don't that. Fuck, I'm a fucking MC. Yeah. And you hear it so perfectly on mm-hmm. this on this mm-hmm. album mm-hmm. and on this record, man. But then, the story about this record, man, you're talking about the story about when you performed in Iran. Yeah. Can I was tell in, us about I that? I was invited to Iran um, to speak a, at a conference about the concept of Black Lives Matter. So it wasn't the Black Lives Matter organizers, but that was the concept. And that's been like a, that's a thing that Paul Robeson did. That's a thing that Harry Belafonte did. That's a thing that Nina Simone did. So basically, you know, throughout time, you have the U.S. government basically pointing the finger at other countries, talking about their human rights offenses. And meanwhile, they're just killing black people like mm-hmm. it's like, you know what I'm saying? With no consequences <laughs> yeah, like, for anybody. Like, like you know, chicken. Yeah, no big deal. So uh, so they, they had a conference and they invited us and they said, will you come and, you know, and I know that, that uh, in Iran, hip hop is illegal. Why? Um, I mean, it was illegal for a long time in Cuba as well. Because of freedom of expression? Or, no, or because... Of, of, or, or shielding criticism? Because no. Hip-hop, what, what is it? No, it's, it's, it's basically... So if you look at the way that the U.S. and like this culture is like destroying other people's culture. They talk about like the global monoculture. Mm-hmm. So like basically... And the great Satan and its influences. In well, no, I'm saying like the, you don't have to necessarily take over another country's government. If you get McDonald's and Twitter, that's, that's what I mean. And like that's what so I mean. And so, like, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. if you get tapped into this whole you'll iPhone lose, culture, yeah, you'll lose the whole meaning of who you are, right? And and eventually you you lose your culture, and it doesn't matter if you necessarily your government is aligned with theirs. If your if your like citizenship thinks exactly like this culture, then eventually they will start making decisions and they will start demanding that their government be like our government. And so they've been really successful at like keeping Western culture out of their cipher. And so, and I respect that. I mean, there was something really beautiful about being there, man. These people are some of the most beautiful human beings in the world, and they they found they knew I was American before they knew I was Muslim. So it's not like they're just embracing me because I'm Muslim. They were like, "Where are you from?" And I tell them like I'm from America, and they'd be like, "You came to visit us. You have a home in my country and in my heart and in my home for you for so for life for you." Dude, I'm saying like I was sitting, I, w- I sat down to eat in a restaurant one time and this old these old men came in and they were like, is it okay if we sit with you? And they start talking and then they just start ordering food and they're like How's making... How's Iranian food, by the way? Man? <laughs> Slam. Fat, like fat, fat boy heaven? Did fat boy oh heaven? Oh. Son. Son. Yo, King, we gotta go. Son. Son. <laughs> 
King's like, Yo, fuck you, come nah, <laughs> nah, everything, no, King, King, everything King's is grilled right everything. in front of you. So if you go to a restaurant, like it's it's all grilled right. and it's directly yeah. in front of you. Right. And so you're sitting there watching it be grilled and like, man, it's just the wafting of the like essence the aroma. of the like fam. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, crazy. So I'm sitting with this old these old men and they're like they ordered a bunch of stuff and it comes all in one dish. You all eat out of the same dish with your hands together. And I'm struggling, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm used to fork Intensive, life, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And so they're like taking, they're like making me individual bites of food and like handing them to me. And so I, this, it'd be like, you know, some of the meat, some of the rice, some of the vegetables, a thing of bread with the sauce and then hand it to me. And none of them are eating. And so they're, they're just handing me bites of food. And I'm, I'm just like eating, eating. And then when I, I'm like, thank you, I'm good, please eat. And they're like, no, we, you have to be satisfied first. I'm like, no, please eat. So they start like pushing food into my mouth. <laughs> and then once I'm totally done, then they start eating. And right. these men are older than me. So that for me, I'm like, I should be serving them. But, you know, they see that somebody came to visit them. And uh, so, you know, the same was true in Cuba. They just didn't want like American influence. And they see that as American culture. Because black American music is the number one export of America. Of course. You know what I'm saying? The starting biggest with, export. Starting I, I with jazz. Say, I and always then, say like entertainment, particularly entertainment that's fueled by our culture, is the biggest export. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Black people in America are teaching the world how to remain human in the face of, of this global domination. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're the first human beings on earth. Of course. Yeah. So anyway, you're out there and then things kind of take a... Yeah, so, so okay, so what happened in Cuba was that Harry Belafonte said if Fidel could hear political hip-hop, he would understand. Right. And so he worked with, with Fidel, and then he worked with some, some rappers to basically come and perform for Fidel. So, he, so Fidel gave Mr. Belafonte his word, these people are safe. And then he talked to the rappers and was like, will you go perform for him? So they were trying to do that, but they didn't tell me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And so I get over there, and they're like, will you do Uncle Sam? Goddamn, that's one of my, my joints. Yeah. Um, what album was that from? From That's that's on Undisputed Truth. Okay, okay. And uh, so I was like, yeah. And I mean, they had like the Shiite clerics were there in the room, and they were so beautiful to me. Like every day, like I'm, I was speaking and just doing my joints a cappella, and they would come, and I'm saying like, these men are like holding my face with both their hands. These like old men. And they're just like, my son... You know what I'm saying? And they'll like kiss you on the top of the head and they're just, you know what I'm saying? It's beautiful. And you're doing Uncle Sam Goddamn. Well, so they asked me to do that song. Uh, the, the people that brought me, not right, the right, clerics. Right, right. But I, I, you know, so I deferred to them and, I, and they said, will you please do it on the stage with the beat? They're like, when we invited Brother Ali, we want to see Brother Ali. And so my ego, again, is like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Because when they said that, stage, you know what yo. I'm saying? <laughs> and they brought in all of these students. They knew how to get us. They right. brought in all of these, like, students from Senegal, West Africa, to, like, come and, like, listen. And I'm there with, like, the head ministers of the Nation of Islam. My man Amir Suleiman was there. And then there's, like, elders. There's, like, these, like, you know what I'm saying, attorneys and educators and doctors and, like, lawyers. You know what I'm saying? It's super dope. So... They asked to do the song, and, like, people in the room start clapping. So my ego is like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 uh, you know what I'm saying? This is, why I, this is why I got into this joint, you know what I'm saying? And um, so I get on the stage. I plug in my iPad, and I had the, I, I had some instrumentals on there. And the clerics, like the, the Shiite like, uh, imams, were like, yeah, go ahead. They proved it. Yeah. So I'm, I start doing it, and I get done, and... Uh, immediately I'm like whisked away to like some interview or something like that. Like, like the organizers grabbed me and like took me into another room. And then I noticed the, the chief organizers got up and left, like ran out. So I'm like, okay, this is strange. Cause I know that's illegal to do. Like, you're not allowed to do that. But I'm like, okay, we're just in this hotel. It's no big deal. They come back and get me and they're like, yo, um, there's five TV stations in Iran. They're all controlled by the government that that performance you just gave is right now it's playing on all of them so like these people clearly have something to do with the government because like you, you can't just put something Be on tv right. yeah it's not public access tv you know what i'm saying like this is like they got content yeah and they and they put it on the tv and it starts playing all the time over and over and over again and and you know people start recognizing me on the street and they're like you're the man and they're like are you safe and they're like isn't that illegal and all this stuff so then the, there's people in Iran that rhyme, like there's MCs everywhere, and they're dope. And so, but they have to do it secretively, and if they get caught, they can go to prison. And some of them like move to Lebanon or other places. 
and they have to like literally leave their homeland to be able to to MC. pursue pursue Rap. a career. You know what I'm saying? So th- I didn't I didn't know I was gonna be rapping at all. I'm thinking right. I'm gonna spit acapellas and give speeches. So now I'm rapping on TV, and I didn't check in with them, and I'm so out of pocket right now. And and on the thing, on the TV thing that they were broadcasting, on the podium, it says the name of the hotel I'm staying at. And so I go on Instagram. It was a picture of me and Fashion that I posted on Instagram. They blew up the comment section, super vulgar, like death threats. Like, we know where you are. We're going to come get you. How dare you? Who do you think you are? You're just a pawn for the government and da-da-da-da. Because that's what it looks like to them. Because nothing's on TV unless the government puts it there. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, fam. And then... Pictures of me and the Nation of Islam brothers are like start circulating on in, in like the right, the alt right like websites. And they're like over here. Yeah. Yes, sir. So they're like Nation of Islam and their spokesman, their, 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 their lap dog, uh, white rapper, brother Ali, um, are go to attend Black Lives Matter and they're training with ISIS in, hmm. in Iran. ISIS hates Shiite Muslims. They hate Iran. They're enemies. You know what I'm saying? It's like these people have no idea what they're talking about, but that's starting to circulate. And I'm just like, yo, I don't, I, and, and, I, I no longer trust the people that brought me. Right. But aren't they also like now incorporating um, images of people saying death to America? Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the other tripped out things. So it's, it comes time for, on uh, Friday and it's Juma. And so it's like, we're going to go to the mosque for, for a prayer. There's only one mosque in town. It's at the, the University of Tehran. And there's a government imam that's given this the the lecture, and every five minutes the whole crowd chants "Allahu Akbar," uh, you know, death to England, death to Saudi Arabia, death to Israel, death to America. Mm. Now, wow. I've been a revolutionary a long time. You know what I'm saying? I was from the time I was a little kid. Like I was raised on Malcolm, Huey. That's that's I was raised on that from the time I'm seven years old. So I, but I'm sitting in this audience like. What do you mean by that? Like, I felt defensive about a man in a way I never have felt before. Yeah, how's that even work? Because it's, it's, it's like you go to see your friend's house and they're like, yo, your mom, your, your dad beat, your stepdaddy beats you. He ain't nothing. And it's true. But you're like, Dude, you can't say, yeah, fuck you my can't. Dad. Nah, man, you can't just do that. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's my family's business. Right, right. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, you know, and in the song I say, um, you know, I, you ain't talking about the people being whipped in the back. I'm tripping because I never felt defensive like that. You got to be more specific than that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to say, like, I know you're talking about the government, but, like, yeah, so I'm having these images of, like, my community. And I'm like, are you talking about, like, what do you mean by that? I don't, I'm not referring to that. You can't just say America, total, right. all, all of them. You can't do that. And it, And that was a lesson for me, too, because it's like, how many groups of people have I condemned? How many times have I said, man, white folks don't care about that? And like, yeah, maybe a lot don't, but there are some that are out here like dedicating their some lives. Their they're lives not safe decades. in their family. Like they're they're outcasted by their families because they're telling the truth. And they might sit down, you know what I'm saying? They might sit down with their with their uncle and instead of kicking, like not talking to their uncle anymore, they're like, man, I really want to talk to you about the fact that these are human beings and why are you saying this and da 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 da. And they're, they're having those difficult conversations. You know what I'm saying? Or they're the ones speaking up. They're like, how come we don't hire black people here? You know what I'm saying? Oh, you're never getting invited to lunch again, fam. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm just saying these white folks are tripping, th- like how many times have I done that? Right. You know what I'm saying? Or how many times have I been, have I been like, uh, you know how these so-and-sos are? Yeah, I mean, maybe I mean, some other section of the Muslim community right, right. or something. Uh, you know how them so-and-sos are. Right. Blanket, you know what I'm saying? Blanket indictment. Yeah, man. So I, so I'm I'm learning a lot from this. And, um, you know, I start realizing. So and, and then there are people, organizers for the conference they're they're all about serving so they serve you when they're hosting you and but they all have keys from my hotel room and most of the time they'll and but they're just walking in the room b like like <laughs> most of the time they're, they're it's, they'll come in with like a tray of tea right. and don't let them find out what your favorite thing is because they're trying to give it to you every 10 minutes right, right. so one time i'm like do you have any mint tea you know what i'm saying man don't let them know that mint get, tea, mint tea yeah so that. there's mint tea everything you know right. what i'm saying you like mint tea right so but people are just walking in my room and now I got people straight up saying, you're at the Hotel Estiglau. I know where you are. And people are walking in my room and I don't know them. You know what I'm saying? It h- horrifying, man. It's one of the times, like I've had several times where I thought it was very, very possible and even probable that I was going to die. Right. 
And I'm saying you haven't lived, you don't really know yourself until you're in that until moment. You, into, yeah, until until you're in tune with your perceived death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where it's like a dying is not an idea right now. It's a reality. And, and then you, they have this out of body experience. Like, and what I realized, ready to die, like, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, I've been in that situation. That's not the first time I've had a, a feeling like that. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm not fearful. Like God, Allah is my witness. I wasn't. I wasn't afraid of dying in that moment. I was afraid of meeting God with all of my my junk. But I really believe in Allah's mercy. I really do believe in Allah's mercy. And um, you know, there's a story about two two sinners that both come on the day of judgment, and they both have done the most horrible things in the world. Just imagine whatever the worst thing you can think of. They both did it a lot. You know, that was their lifestyle. And so Allah says to them, "You're condemned." You know what I'm saying? and go to the fire it's a story so the, the so the two of them start walking towards the fire and one of them turns around and looks back and i said why you turn around i said because i thought you were going to forgive me he says you're forgiven you know what I'm <laughs> and allah says i am as my servant believes me to be right so the person that believes in allah's love and mercy that's how allah is to them you know what i'm saying or or the creator or the right, right. yeah so you know i believe in allah's mercy i know my sins and allah knows my sins and and, and all of the horrible things i've said done thought felt you know, even if I don't do them outwardly, my heart is like I've I've judged people mm-hmm. that are definitely better than me. Mm-hmm. I've they're judging anybody in the world. Like people tell me all the time, like um, I'm so embarrassed. I'm out here puffing this herb. I'm like me judging you for that would be worse than doing it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, because I've had people teach me how to love. Right. And so I'm I'm supposed to. That's the standard that I'm supposed right. to be living by. Anyway, so I'm like, okay. I start realizing how unsexy martyrdom really is, though. <laughs> Cause it's like you know I've known people who have died like so so Sean Price was my man mm. you know what I'm saying recipe Sean Price I, yeah yeah I yeah we got close near the end of his life it's not like we go way back but we toured together you know he he had a he had a brother sister thing with my wife you know what I'm saying he's just a he's a beautiful brother like for as as tough as he is on them records he everybody that knows him knows that he's a sweet the sweetest guy hilarious person like man we were in. We we went to the the airport in in Australia, and they made the beautiful donuts like the ones that we got, like yeah. those artisan donuts. He was like, "Yo, this joint's a work of art, B." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so he bought like two dozen, but then he was like, he had bad teeth, right. so if he ate donuts, it would hurt his right, teeth. Right, right. So he walked around, big old Sean Price, and this big old hat, this big old Phillies coat and hat, matching coat and hat that said B on it, walking around handing out donuts to white people, kids. Cause he's like, I had to buy these cause they're beautiful, but I can't eat them. Yeah. So, so imagine Sean P like these people have, first of all, they don't see black people very m- often right. and they're seeing this dude with these like size 46 jeans on and like, you know, brand new air force ones and, and he's handing out donuts to kids. And so people are seeing him and they're like terrified at first, but then he's, disarming, but then he's like, he's like, oh, you, them you, you, donut. Of, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, man. Beautiful. And right. so, man, you know, so I, so anyway, so anyway, but, so I've known people that died, right? And I've, I've, I'm like, you know, I've, I've been around Malcolm X's daughters, and I've been around, you know, people that have died, and I know what it looks like, and like Dilla's mom, you know, my Dukes and stuff. And I don't know her, but like watching what their lives are like, people come and and tell you, oh man, I have so much respect for the person that you lost, and you know, and all they want is that person, and it's like, yeah, but Daddy's still gone, right, man. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It, daddy's still gone, and like even if the even if that health, that that life insurance check comes, or even if it the replace, community it does a Kickstarter daddy, and you get accents. some, no, you're still gone from their life. Okay, so so listen, you go through this crazy shit where you're like, I could die. Yeah, you finally get to the airport, and then some other shit happens. Yeah, I can't. So the the credit cards don't work. Your credit the phone doesn't work. work. There's phone, no internet. You, you can't get money out of the ATM. You know what I'm saying? And so I sat in the airport for days. With no money. I, t- I spent my last money going to the airport. So I'm sitting there and like literally I no have Sean I, Price to give you a donut. No Sean Price to get a kid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If he was there, man, he would have made it all better. But so I'm sitting there and people are like recognizing me. Why at the are you airport. there for three days? Because you can't change your flight there. The person who bought oh, you, were trying your, to change, you were trying to leave early. I was trying to go home. Yeah. yeah, I was I was supposed to be there for almost a month. And like a weekend, I'm like, dude, I could die. Like, and, and these people are just being reckless with my safety. They they just got me out here on some mission, that some dummy mission that I didn't sign up for and right. didn't even know we were. I didn't you know were we were doing that. Yeah. So if they had said to me like, 
the man, wait till Imam Khomeini, Khomeini, wait till he hears Uncle Sam, goddamn, it's going to change the game. Right. I could have made a decision. I don't want to be on, 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 uh, his, I don't want to be on that you level. You feel me? Yeah, yeah. So, so like maybe I could have, you know, but they didn't do that. Right. They just, they just did, they just put me in that situation. Right. And, um, you know, and, and with respect to them, it's a highly politicized society. Mm -hmm. Everybody is on an agenda. Everybody you talk to has some kind of agenda that they're working on. You know what I'm saying? It's a very, very politicized society. So that's kind of the way that they get down sometimes. You know what I'm saying? So I can't necessarily blame them. They think they're doing something good. And now Amir Suleiman is telling me that they're, they're like doing this whole program and he ran with hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So maybe it was a good, you know what I'm saying? Maybe that had something to do with some good openings right, right, right. for hip-hop there. But then what happens with your passport, my dude? So, okay, so I, I'm in the airport for days and days and days and can't get, I, I, they won't let me leave. There's only one flight a day. I can't, I can't call Tiff and ask for a flight and ask her to, you know what I'm saying? Finally, I'm like crying to somebody. I'm like standing in front of somebody, like weeping because I haven't eaten in days. You know what I'm saying? I'm sleeping on my airport. suitcase. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, how's this going to end? Am I going to like pass out and they put me in the hospital and then I ask for and a you, phone call? Yeah, and then you're back in the and, same and, and then I call, but like, how's this going to end? So finally, uh, Amir Suleiman, the poet, his brother comes to the airport. He's like, B, they're looking for you. Your act, they're looking for you. If they, do, if you don't hit them up, they're going to put out an all points bulletin, American lost in Iran, and the police are going to be looking for you. He's like, please let me take you back to them. You know what I'm saying? So he takes me back to them and I basically beg them to change my ticket. The person that bought your ticket has to change it. Right. So they finally change my ticket and I finally get to go home. Then I get home and I'm, here. I'm 4S status. What is 4S? Your shit, 4S. Your, well, you get, you get to customs and, yeah. and then what happens? Your shit starts beeping. Well, yeah. So, so, yeah. So that was actually, so when I came back from Iran, I'm thinking they're going to sweat me. The dude was at the, the customs guy was standing there waiting for me. I hand him my passport and he's like, no, you're good, brother Ali. Just a regular customs right. guy. The line where you go in and you, you like you have to fill out papers and like anybody that's ever traveled and come back, you know, you fill out papers. They take your picture with the machine. They process your passport. They, you know what I'm saying? How long you've been back? Da, 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 da. Like the, literally there was a dude standing there and I go to hand him my passport and he's like, no, welcome home, brother Ali. I'm like, oh, okay. So y'all knew about this the whole time. Right. So then the next time I go to travel, I'm going to Spain with one of my teachers. And we are coming back. And man, they just, they gave me complete hell coming back. They embarrassed my wife. You know what I'm saying? They, they pressed they, you. They, yeah, man. I mean, they, they, they pulled all of her clothes out in front of everybody. Um, you know, they're asking me to give them names of my manager. And like, they're, they're just, they're just. It's an interrogation as a parent. Yeah, as and to. they held me so long. One of the things Chuck D told me is, if you're going to travel a lot and you have a wife and kids, tell them when you're going to leave and tell them when you're going to come home so that they understand that you're serv you're doing this for them right. and that they're involved in it. You're not just coming and going like this is a hotel. Right. And he said, and stick to it. If you say you're going to be home on Thursday, don't come home Saturday. Right. If, you say, if you say you're going to leave Monday, don't leave Sunday. Like, tell them when you're going to leave. Tell them when you come back. Report to them. And they like they held us so long that we missed our flight. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then we had to call home and be like, "Yo, we can't pick you up." The kid, right. our children. You right. know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, man. So that's just. And then like, they tell you, uh, what, "What? What is this 4S thing?" I'm thinking it's an iPhone thing, man. Nah, 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 nah. So yeah, basically, like it was. Uh, they said that I was 4S, and he said that 5S is, means you're you're on the no fly list. So I was one step below no fly list status, but it it meant that. For months, every time that I flew anywhere, even if I'm just flying to Chicago, like not even going out of the country, that they're going to they're going to touch every article that I bring with. Did me. you go through that coming here? No, sir. No, you it got, got that changed. It got lifted. Yeah, and it's if crazy I, if, how, how easily you were. So I reached out to a lawyer, and I and I reached out to a person that I believe to be a saint, and I believe that when the saints ask for things, that they're given whatever they ask for. So I reached out to the lawyer and I reached out to the saint and the saint told me, you're okay. You're safe. Don't worry. And the, the lawyer called me back and I was like, let me get back to you. Yeah. And they were like, well, we're on standby. You know what I'm saying? Flying ever since then. I went to Lebanon and came back. No problem. That's crazy, man. No problem. That's crazy. I believe in these people. And, and everybody doesn't have to believe in them, but right. I believe in them. That's crazy. You know, I, I want to wrap this up, man. Um, you about to go on swing in the morning? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Five fingers of death. 
I don't know if I'm doing Five Fingers. I think I'm going to ask him if I can do the Uncle Usi taught me song. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the last time you were there, yeah. you embodied the Five Fingers of Death. Yes. I want you to share a cappella with us, man. Okay. I want, I want my audience to really know who the fuck you are. Mm. If mm. they don't already know. Mm, 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 mm. What should I do? Should I do one of the joints from the album? I mm. mean, whatever you want to do, man. Huh. This is you, man. You brother mm. Ali, man. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. Okay, I wasn't prepared, but we what? We, we keeps ready. We keeps ready. Yeah. You gotta be ready for combat. Yeah, be ready, so you don't have to get ready. If you if you keep ready, you don't exactly. have to get ready. Yeah. Hmm. 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 Can you do the beatbox, man? <laughs> I'm bad at beatboxing. Hmm. <laughs> Dear Black Sun. There's people you've never met who fear and hate you for something that you never did. And these people are so self-convinced. Sometimes they pull a trigger, call it self-defense. And in that sad insanity, their fear is realer to them than your humanity. But that's their problem. It's not yours. Listen to your pop for a second. These are the confessions of a father brokenhearted who don't know how to pull his only son out of a target. Mm. They lied when they said it was the bottom where you started. You were a king long before them ships departed. You are not defined by anybody else's crimes. And you don't need to answer for what happens in their minds. And you are not confined by their imaginary lines. You don't need permission to exist with the divine. In fact, you don't need permission from no one, including me. You need not do anything but be. Just breathe. Whatever you dream, let it mean and you're free tears on your cheek never made nobody weak sometimes you gotta grieve let it burn let it bleed then let yourself heal pray to god that it will you have a spirit that a bullet can't kill that doesn't make it any less real they say it takes a man to raise a man you're slipping through my hands like grains of sand and here i stand trying to wrestle with the hourglass maybe see how long i can make an hour last raising a man you're slipping through my hands like grains of sand and here i stand trying to wrestle with the hourglass maybe see how long i can make an hour last dear black son i can't protect you like i want to I never judge you. All that I can do is love you. And that's all anyone can ever do is love you. All I could do is wonder how could anyone not love you? They recognize divine in you. So they try to find themselves by defining you. They're living in a myth that they don't want to lose. And now they're too terrified to face your kind of truth. But every single time you shine, it's proof that they might have threw a chain around your body, never conquered you. They don't always honor you, but they love your culture. Let me show you how to move when the law approach you. It's best to keep your hands where they can see them. Try to understand that you're not even what they're peeping. They don't see a sweet kid that loves his little sister. Their minds are seeing 500 years of pictures. In fact, they don't visualize a kid. They see grown man imagery, mythic masculinity. But you're not their fetishes or fears, nor my ambitions and tears. Nothing can interfere. We gotta trust the seeds once we sow them. We hold them when they're growing, but we never really own them. We love up, own them, and play with them, pray for them, and cling very closely to the moments. They say it takes a man to raise a man. You're slipping through my hands like grains of sand, and here I stand, trying to wrestle with the hourglass. Maybe see how long I can make an hour last. Dear Black Sun. Woo! Brother Ali, and that's off your new album. Mm Mm-hmm. Dear Black Sun. Yeah. I actually thought about you. I hit you up when I was writing that Thank song. Thank you, sir, man. Because I was like, man, for, I was really thinking about you. I appreciate that, that, man. Yeah. Brother Ali, man. All the beauty in this whole life. Mm-hmm. Dude, Cinco de Mayo. Com- coming out Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. And then also we're going on tour. And uh, um, the way the Rhyme Series works is that when a new artist comes on the label, the established artists take them out on tour and teach them how to make a business out of touring. Mm. You know what I'm saying? This is one of the few businesses left where uh, people of color can can make a living. Where anybody really can make a living if you do it, run it like a small business. You go into this not like we're going to go have a party. Like we're opening a small business called Brother Ali. And we have a small business called, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, that's what was done for me by Atmosphere when I came in. And so on this particular tour, our sister Sa Rock is coming with us. Yo, she's amazing on your Yo, album. Yo, Sa Rock is a beast. She's amazing on your album, dude. Yo, that's, she was being nice to me. Yeah. Because she ain't want to, she ain't want to whoop. Uh, she, she don't want to body in your She ain't want to. She yeah. She ain't want to. You know what I'm no, saying? No, she killed it on that. On that. On Dude, record, man. Please, anybody within the sound of my voice, please go and listen. This is Black Thought's favorite new rapper. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they just did a joint. She was just in New York recording a joint with him. Yes. I'm saying this. She is an absolute beast, and she's complete royalty. 
This, she's the she's the reason. Like people like her are why I got involved in hip hop. Mm. Well, internets, listen, do me a do me a favor. I don't really ask y'all for favors, man. I do this for the culture, man. But do me a, do me this favor, man. Like brother Ali is one of my favorite rappers, man. I'm a fan of this man. He has an amazing album. I don't sell you bullshit, B. Like I put y'all onto that bevel. That's put y'all onto that Tito's. Listen, brother Ali's album, all the beauty in his whole life, is worth every dime, man. Spend that money, man. Thank Brother you. Ali, man, thank you so much, man. Thank you, man. I, I, I love you, man. And, I love you. And, 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 I really love you, you Rich. Man. And I'm sorry that I just came up here and just talked a bunch of heavy stuff. No, I mean, you know, hey, man, you know, you know, they, you know. To, what, the, they to know. the eight people that listened all the way to the end. <laughs> Now's we the time to smoke you. your drugs, Internet. <laughs> Yo, Brother Ali, man, thank you. thank you, man. Listen, Internet's. You know what this is, man. Dream those dreams and then man up, woman up, and live those dreams because the life without dreams is black and white. And the universe flows in technicolor and surround sound. Learn all that. <laughs> I listen to the end. This episode of the Combat Jack Show is produced by Jonathan Mena, executive produced by A. King, and this is an official Loudspeakers Network production. <laughs> I'm dead. I'm really mad. Y'all made me do that. I'm so mad right now. <laughs> Please don't post that anywhere. <laughs> I'm so mad at y'all. <laughs> bop, bop, bop. <laughs>